Okay, so first of all, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for staying towards the end, <laughs> staying till the end and like coming to see this. The best part though is it means that you guys get extra servings of samples. So <laughs> the score. All right. Well, um, if you guys aren't really familiar with us, she did a great job introducing us. Um, we are Annie and Dan Shannon. We have been vegan since we were teenagers. Like I went vegan about 13, 14. Um, Dan was vegan in high school. We were vegan back in like the late 80s. <laughs> I don't know how many of you were vegan back then, but if you were, you can probably remember, this was back when finding tofu in a grocery store was a big score. Um, if you found soy milk, it was usually in like some weird corner in the back, it was dusty, and it was the kind that came, had to shake it up really, really, really hard in order to maybe get that silt at the bottom to like mix in. It was what we like to call, it was the Model T age of like mock meats and like their boat cheeses and all of that. And um, it was kind of a dark time for vegans, <laughs> you know, because there was all this promise and there was all these things out there that we wanted to eat, but things that were available at the time, they just weren't quite meeting up to what our dreams were. So skip to the forward to us being adults. Can you still hear me? All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, uh, skip forward to Dan and I are adults. We have graduated from college and we are both working at People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Dan's working on the KFC campaign and I'm working on anti circuses and we fell in love. <laughs> um, yeah, in 2009 we got married. And the thing was is that when we were campaigners, we had traveled literally all over the world, like promoting compassionate living. Um, I spent time in Ireland and like all over Europe, and like it was it was great. We had got to meet vegans from like literally everywhere, and we kept hearing the same thing though from people that there was like three reasons why they were having a hard time staying vegan, or they were hesitated to make that leap from being like vegetarian to vegan, or whatever it was. Um, and the three things were, first of all, they thought the, the food was weird. They were like, I just don't get it. I don't want to eat weird grains that I have to get out of a bin. They were like, I don't want to eat lentils. I don't want to eat something that I can't pronounce. They just, they weren't into this foreign exotic foods. Um, the second thing was, is that they thought it was inconvenient. You know, thought it was time consuming. They had this idea in their head that if they went vegan, they were going to have to make every single thing from scratch. Um, and basically their whole life would be you know, pressing soybeans to make tofu. <laughs> you know, they just had this misconception in their head that they would have to bake their own breads and, you know, make their own soy milk. It was, you know, it was this idea that, you know, it, I can understand it came from a certain time, but it really was out of date. And then also, they didn't want to give up on things that they loved. You know, there was things that they had grown up with. That they just, you know, they wanted to go vegan, they cared about animals, they cared about their health and the environment. But the idea of like, giving up like Philly cheesesteak sandwiches or you know, nachos on watching the Super Bowl and that sort of thing, it just really was like not appealing to them. They really didn't want to change their whole life. And so, you know, it was really frustrating for us because we, you know, you could tell people like, hey, you can, you can make, you know, nachos with like this cheese sauce, you can do this, you could tell people this. But it really came down to, unless there was a resource out there, unless there was like a way to show people how to do this, you could tell people this, but you really couldn't prove it to them. So in 2009, we got married. We had friends come from like all over the world. We had a friend who like flew in from Cuba. You know, it was pretty great. Um, and we had this, such a wonderful time. And then everybody went home. And we were trying to think of a way to like keep in touch with the people that we love. So we started this blog called Meet the Shannons. And in it, we were, you know, we, we talked about TV shows, we talked about our marriage, but we also started this project called the Betty Crocker Project that we thought our friends would think was cool, <laughs> you know? Um, sorry, I didn't mean. Um, but basically, it still all started like this. We were watching the movie Julia and Julia. So raise your hand if you've seen that movie. All right, good, good portion of you. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I apologize for the spoiler, but if you have seen it, you probably remember this certain scene where she boils the lobster. And it's like a big part of the movie, and it's really, you know, you watch it, and they're playing, like, 
you know, the serial killer song and all of that. And you can see throughout the entire like scene that she's really conflicted about boiling these lobsters. But you know, it's like she just can't do it. She's like watching them in the bag, all of this. Anyways, in the end, she boils the lobsters. And the way the movie's sort of framed, we're all supposed to sort of celebrate this. We're all supposed to be like, yay, she overcame her fear to finish her project. But we didn't see it that way. We saw that she had overcome her conscience. And they're like, that's not cool. <laughs> no. So we, we sat down and we were like, you know what we can do? We're going to start our own project. We are going to do our own cook through a book, like recipe by recipe project. And we're going to show people, you know, how to be vegan and really like show people that it's, this is fun. Like cooking can be fun without having to do something like a lobster. So being the campaigners that we are, we sat down and we like tried to figure out like bullet point list. What was it we really wanted to do? And that's when we came across Betty Crocker. Now Betty Crocker has this reputation for just a long time reputation for like showing like everyday cooks how to use ingredients you can find in any grocery store to you know just make something creative and sometimes kind of crazy <laughs> you know but always you know turns out pretty good so we decided we we're going to take the Betty Crocker cookbook and we we're going to take those like sort of recipes as the inspiration and that sort of idea except for instead of using Betty Crocker products and General Mills products we were going to use all these new fantastic products that were out there now for vegans. So it was just, it was hopefully going to be a way to like show our friends, like look at this cool thing we did with the tofurkey. Um, and then one day we were in the New York Times <laughs> and it just kind of blew up. And yeah, like we now have about 3,000 people a day visit our blog, you know, um, I'm not sure the number and how many a week, really large. <laughs> and we have a book now that is called Betty Was Vegan which is sort of a, a cookbook slash memoir of like the three years that we spent cooking through the Betty Crocker cookbook, um, sharing the recipes that we made, but also sharing recipes from our own childhood, because like she said, there were some recipes in there that were actually kind of a little too crazy. You know, like there was a, a liver and onions, which we did veganize, and we were told by a friend who had actually had liver and onions that it tasted very similar. But does the world really need a vegan liver and onions recipe? <laughs> we don't need that. So, you know, we, we replaced that instead with like recipes on like how to make your own gnocchi and stuff like that. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to start off with one of my favorite recipes in the book. It's called black pepper tofu macaroni salad. Now, the original Betty Crocker recipe is called ham and cheese macaroni salad. <laughs> um, and it really literally is like the original recipe is like ham, cheddar cheese, uh, mayonnaise, and macaroni. Like it's, it's like very, very, very bare bones. Um, what we did instead is that we kind of tried to figure out what was the, the thing we are going to use to replace the ham. And what we did was we used uh, uh, tofu that's been marinated in liquid smoke, rags with fluid amino acids, um, some black pepper and a little lemon juice and olive oil. And what we're doing is we're really trying to get, you know, we use the rags and the liquid amino acids to sort of get that that meaty flavor without like, you know, having meat, <laughs> basically. Um, so in this recipe, we've doubled it, but it's because, you know, that way you guys can have a bunch of samples. But, so, anyways, basically what we did was we marinate that for about 20 minutes. And then we bake it for about 20 minutes, and we flip it over, we bake it again, and then we put it in the refrigerator for about 20 minutes. And what we're doing is we're really trying to like, you know, make that sort of recreate the idea of like a, a ham cold cut. Now, now basically, um, you can really use anything to do this. You can use like tofurkey slices. You can use, you know, um, some. There's also like faux ham, like products out there. But we wanted to go with the tofu because we really felt like it was something that. Um, would work with this size of a, of a dish. And the thing was also, is that we were making this dish for a potluck that was happening at PETA that day for, um, it's called Squirrel Appreciation Day, which is like a holiday that they have at the PETA office, you know? So, um, you know, if you ever wonder what the kind of holidays they pull throw potlucks for at PETA, <laughs> that's, that's what they do. Um, but it was a big hit, you know? We, we, it was actually one of the stars of the, 
of the, the day. And, um, <laughs> all right, so what we did was we chilled it over, we chilled it for about 20 minutes so it's not warm because basically, like veganaise, it's a lot like real mayonnaise in that you don't want it hot, you know, it's <laughs> unpleasant. And so then you also have it with some cooked macaroni that's also been drained and chilled as well. All right. I guess we're a little overzealous with our proportions. <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> I do. I like to feed people. It's, yeah. Everybody has their mice in this. <laughs> All right. So, next thing we're going to do is we're going to add one red onion that's been diced. Um, now, the thing was, is that we're going to make sure that we keep the red onion raw because um, we're also going to be adding diced celery as well. And the reason we're doing that is because, you know, you have cooked macaroni, you have tofu. These aren't exactly like the most firmest, like substantial, you know, products out there. Um, and so adding like the raw onion is going to add like a really nice flavor. But also adding these two things raw is also going to give like your, your salad like a little bit of like a crisper flavor, like a little bit more of like a, I don't know, it's not mushy, basically. <laughs> and so we're adding the onion also. Because, you know, the other thing about Betty Crocker, as much as I love her, God bless her, she's not real, but the, the, the recipe themselves, um, they just do not add a lot of vegetables <laughs> to their recipes. And so, you know, it's one of those things where I, I do admit that if you compare some of our recipes to the recipes that Betty Crocker has in the original book, we are very heavy handed with, with vegetables. So, another of my crimes, I call them. <laughs> so, all right. So, Dicing the red onion. Now, the other thing about this recipe too, when we served it at the potluck, was that, um, I don't know how many potlucks you go to, but it seems to me that a lot of vegan potlucks we go to, they have a lot of the same thing over and over again, which is tofu scramble, brownies, <laughs> you know. Oh, um, almonds, yes, exactly. And, you know, and it's, it's funny, because there's a lot of cool stuff out there, um, but for some reason, you know, like just the traditional potluck stuff, a lot of times doesn't show up. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to show with this macaroni salad was that like we can do old school, you know, barbecue potluck style stuff without, you know, having to use meat. All right. So next thing we're gonna do, um, so we're gonna add the celery now. All right, so, uh, four. So we're, we're chopping up four stalks of celery. Now, one of the things about this that's also good is that um, celery is one of those things that naturally complements onion. I don't know how many of you guys watch like cooking shows, but you'll, it, sometimes you'll notice that whenever they use a lot of onion, they also use like celery seed. So if you ever find yourself in a position where you're trying to figure out like, I don't know, like, add a bunch of vegetables, what should I do? If you're gonna add like onion, if you add a little bit of celery, it automatically makes the, the onion taste like just a little less sharp you know, while also bringing out like a little bit of that like green flavor from the celery. So just the naturally compatible. All right. First of all, how awesome is my husband? <laughs> all right. She's gonna cut me in half later. <laughs> all right. So then the next thing we're gonna add is um, a cup of Daya vegan shredded cheddar cheese. Now you can really add like any cheddar cheese you like. We are so lucky, we live in a world where there's like multiple cheddar cheeses out there that you can choose from to shred. Um, you know, like we're just in Portland and we have like this hiding ho stuff that's made from cashews. Amazing, you know, um, there's Dr. Cow. There is, I mean, there's so many. There's that new Pike Hill that just came out. So. Really, you know, this is what we're going with today. It was what we used originally in the recipe, and it is also, you know, one of our personal favorites. But, you know, you can actually just personalize it and add whatever is your favorite. All right. Next, we're going to do um, a cup of frozen peas. Yeah, I should have taken into consideration if we're going to double the recipe. We're going to need like a trough to mix it. <laughs> uh, just add a cup. Yeah. 
Maybe that'll work. How's that? All right. Thank you. That was a really good tip. <laughs> All right. Peas are in. Now, again, this is another thing that we, we've added to this recipe because, you know, I like vegetables. Vegetables are good for you. You should eat them. <laughs> So, and now we're going to get into the, like, the sort of parts, the, sort of the body of the, of the macaroni salad, um, which is more sort of towards, like, the traditional stuff, which is, we're going to be adding sweet pickle relish and um, two cups of vegan mayonnaise. Again, like, we're going to be using uh, vegan aids, but, you know, there's, like, this stuff called Just Mayo that just came out. There's, I mean, a bunch of different, like, vegan mayonnaises out there. Um, Personally, we, we're a vegan A's household, but I don't know. So I guess I'd like to see a raise of hands. Like, how many people like actually like they have like favorite cheeses and favorite mayonnaises and all that sort of stuff already? All right. So I have a question. How many of you guys are actually like vegans? Okay. No, this is good. I always ask that question at every demo, at every, all the the veg fest, and I'm really surprised like how many people like are actually vegans and how many aren't. You know? So, well. We're a vegan household. If you don't have a favorite yet, I would recommend using vegan. <laughs> um, the pickle relish, I would add half a cup. So, while Dan's doing this, I'm going to do a little pitch for the stuff that's called nutritional yeast. Now, a lot of you guys raised your hands already and said you're vegan, so you're familiar with it. So, bear with me for those folks that didn't raise their hands. Now, nutritional yeast has probably one of the most unfortunate names on the planet. Like, nutritional yeast does not sound appetizing at all, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's so unfortunate because nutritional yeast is freaking delicious. It's so good. It is like, you can use it on popcorn just by itself. You can use it in sauces to make something cheesy. You can use it in like gravies to make it sort of nutty. Nutritional yeast, like, you can use it to thicken a sauce while adding a little bit of flavor but also adding like B vitamins, which if you're vegan, is something you really need to like keep in mind. So it's something that's not only really good for you, but it's freaking delicious. And it's very versatile. And so I really encourage you, if you haven't tried it yet, to give nutritional yeast a try. <laughs> like, because it's one of those things, it's a game changer for vegans. For a long time, I wouldn't eat I wouldn't eat nutritional yeast. I just people would put it on pizza or whatever, and I'd just like, no thank you. Um, and then I, I don't even remember what happened, but somehow, maybe accidentally I ate it, <laughs> I don't know. And my whole world changed, you know? And I regretted all those years I was a vegan and I had lived off like baked potatoes and like Dr. Pepper and I never <laughs> had nutrition <laughs> yeast. All right, for the nutrition yeast, we're actually adding four tablespoons. So. Yeah, I'm eating the dough. So, while he's doing the nutrition yeast, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you guys, raise your hands, actually already know nutrition yeast? Oh, you guys are old hats. I didn't, I didn't even tell you about this. I should ask that ahead of time. So, I'm impressed with that because I actually used to live in Atlanta. And I remember when I first moved here, I had to, I was like, go went out to the, city, the streets. Before, there was the Whole Foods I constantly own, and I tried to find nutritional yeast. And I, it was like I was looking for the Holy Grail. Like, you know? And also, I would go and ask people for it, and they would think I was crazy. They would be like, well, we have bread yeast, you know, like they just didn't comprehend. So I'm actually very impressed. How many of you guys know that? Um, but yeah, so I used to live in Atlanta, and I also want to say, we just went this morning to go get like vegan donuts at Revolution Donuts. Um, if that place had been here when I lived here, I don't know if I would have moved. That place is amazing. <laughs> All right, so next, we're going to do two teaspoons of celery seed. So this kind of goes back to that onion. Now, you know, because the thing is we added like a whole red onion to this recipe. And like I said, like that's kind of a strong flavor. So that celery seed is also going to complement that and kind of tone it out a little bit, you know. All right. And now we're going to add four tablespoons of Tony Cachon's Creole seasoning. Now, I don't know if you know this stuff already. Um, it's actually something that, like, it's, I don't know, it's like intended for, like, barbecue or something, you know? And it's, like, it's for, like, super meaty Creole, like, you know, gumbos that have, like, three different types of meat in them or something. Um, it's, it's also, though, a really easy way to, like, 
add a little bit of kick, add a little bit of spice, some black pepper, you know, just the, just the, the punch, you know, that you would need in a recipe, um, just in one, one ingredient. So it's kind of time saving, space saving, money saving. Um, and the thing that's funny is that, you know, we start doing recipes on the blog using this, and we actually heard from this company, they were like, wow, we never even thought that this, it occurred to us that our products were vegan, you know? <laughs> and they started like, like linking to some of our, our recipes on like, their Facebook page. And it was kind of cool, you know, to get that sort of exposure. All right, and then the last thing is we're gonna add one teaspoon of garlic powder, or sorry, two teaspoons of garlic powder, because so we're doubling. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because we want that garlic flavor, you know, we want a little bit of that savoriness. But um, the garlic powder actually, a lot of people can see, they don't really understand that garlic powder is not the same thing as garlic salt. Garlic salt is salt that's been flavored to be like garlic. Garlic powder is just dehydrated garlic and it's been ground up. And what it's going to do is going to thicken up your sauce a little bit while adding flavor, but also because we already have the raw onion in there, it will add that garlic flavor without adding an extra like raw garlic. So you're not gonna do like that double bomb for the breath, you know? <laughs> so yeah. He's gonna give it a couple more turns, but then we're done. Like that was it. Um, what's great about this recipe too is not only does it like feed a whole lot of people, but it's also something that like if you do all the prep work ahead of time, you can do this just like in the kitchen in your office and you can serve it out of potluck. You know, it's very fast, very quick, and it's a great way to show too that like vegan food isn't weird, you know? <laughs> Alright. So I have a question. So how many of you are the token vegan in your office? Yeah. So do you guys I'm going to do the raising of the hand. So how many of you guys, when it comes to time to do like potlucks and parties, have to bring your own food? Oh, that makes me sad. <laughs> oh. Well, hopefully, like, that's one of the things we really tried to focus on with the book, was like creating like a section, like the party section, where there was like some recipes that like made like a huge amount, so that people could like bring these samples to kind of show people that like, if you're going to make vegan food, you don't have to just bring like, a hummus platter, you know, we can like do something a little bit more creative than that. Alright. Okay, do you want to switch sides so you can do that like pleasant thing? Okay. So then oh shoot, we're almost done. So the next one we're doing is uh, vegan ranch dressing. Now vegan ranch dressing, basically when we started this book, there's a handful of things that we found that we never even considered that we were gonna have to find a way to do vegan. Um, for example, on um, Friday, you know, we were kind of like well, once we saw the recipe that had fried eggs, we were kind of like, oh my, what did we even sign up for? We were like, actually kind of embarrassed, because like, we're like, we can't pull out now. Like, I have to figure out how to do this. So one of the things that we came up with, we found, was uh, vegan ranch dressing. There was a bunch of recipes that had it. Everything from like mashed potatoes to like, you know, fried chicken something. And um, then we posted this recipe on our blog, and it, people went crazy. And, you know, the thing is, I spent some time living in Atlanta, and I spent some time living in St. Louis, and I shouldn't have been surprised because I know people who put ranch dressing on like pizza. You know, like there is like this cult of people who like they love ranch dressing. And the thing was is that I went vegan very early on, so I never really got addicted to it. But I'm addicted to this dressing. <laughs> I'm addicted to a vegan ranch dressing. Uh, once we made it, it was the sort of, sort of thing where like I'd make excuses to invite people over so that I have an excuse to make it. <laughs> you know, it's good. Like I, I'm usually a very humble person, but not about this. <laughs> like, we nailed it. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off with um, half a cup, or we're doubling it, so uh, a cup of veganase. Sorry, I'm still breathing into the thing. That's better. So again, we're using veganase for this because we're a veganase household. Um, I'm a very, a very brand loyal. <laughs> um, and then we're also going to do a cup of vegan sour cream. Now this is another product where not all of the vegan sour creams out there are alike. Some of them separate, you know, some of them are a little thicker than others. Um, we, we tend towards the tofuti, but really actually any vegan sour cream actually works in this recipe because you're gonna be blending it up, so it's, it all works. Um, and so the thing was, we're trying to recreate like a buttermilk-based dressing. 
So buttermilk dressings have like a certain sort of consistency and a certain sort of flavor to them that's very unique. And it can be kind of hard to recreate when you're doing like a soy product, whatever, because buttermilk has like a little bit of this tanginess to it. And when you add lemon juice or like any sort of acid to a soy product, you can tend to make it separate. So it can be a little bit challenging. Um, so, oh, it's sour cream. So that's why we decided we'd go with sour cream, which is designed to have that tanginess to it. Um, and we're also going to be using uh, lemon zest rather than lemon juice in the recipe so that it doesn't, it doesn't do that separating thing that I was talking about. All right. And so now we're going to add um, a fourth a cup of tofu. Yes. Now, the reason why we're doing the tofu um, is because we're, the dressing that we're making today is more of a the dip version of it, then because we're going to be serving it with, yeah, um, we're going to be serving it with baby carrots, then it is sort of the salad dressing version. If you're doing like a salad dressing version, you can just add like a little bit more mayonnaise or maybe some soy milk to it to sort of thin it out. Um, but yeah, since we're doing more of a dip version today, we want to kind of make it like a little bit thicker. All right, and so now we're going to add some onion. Um, one and a half to or sorry, uh, three teaspoons. Yes. All right. And so, Dan, we didn't have any way to, to zest the lemon peel, so Dan had to do it on his own here, so, yeah. again, thank you, Dan. <laughs> uh, I know, seriously. I don't know how I got so lucky. Um, now two teaspoons of tahini. Now, tahini, we were at the DC Veg Fest recently doing a, a demonstration, and there was actually all these people who had never had tahini before. So another poll of the audience. How many of you guys have had tahini? Oh, so you guys, I mean, you guys don't even need me. <laughs> yeah, tahini is the best though. It's like, for you guys who didn't raise your hands, tahini is basically a sesame-based dressing. Um, it's so versatile. You can use it to like make a base for like salad dressings. You can use it to like, um, you can use it with like breadcrumbs to like make a, a sort of bread batter coating on like, you know, mock chicken. You can do so much with it. Um, now we're going to add the beloved nutritional yeast. We're adding uh, four teaspoons. Now the next ingredient we're also going to be adding is Bragg's with amino acid. Now the thing is, is a lot of people ask why we use Bragg's so much. Um, basically what Bragg's is, it's sort of a low sodium soy sauce. It's soy based but it has a lot less sodium in it than regular soy sauce, so you get the flavor without all that salt. And because we're using a lot of mock meat in our recipes, um, what we're doing is we're trying to find ways to cut back salt when we can, because mock meat, unfortunately, is wonderful and beautiful and tasty as it is, and how many animals it saves, it's a miracle. Um, most of the times it's based on, like, they get the flavor from some sort of salt. So when you're using you know, a mock meat. You have to kind of keep in mind when you're making the flavors and the sauces and all this sort of stuff, like finding a way to bring out flavor without just reverting to salt. So that's what we did with like most of our recipes. Um, so we, that's why we really encourage people to check out Brad's. Um, now we're gonna add two cloves of garlic, a teaspoon of onion powder, And so, one of the other things we found with uh, the ranch dressing too, I have to ask, so, okay. In the Midwest, people are crazy about ranch dressing. Um, I actually knew a person who their high school quote is ranch dressing forever. <laughs> so, I'm just curious, how many of you guys love ranch dressing? All right, so how many of you guys are from the Midwest? Yeah, there you go. See, every time. <laughs> I, this is sort of my like unofficial scientific study that I'm recording with. <laughs> All right, where are you at? Okay, so now we're going to add some black peppercorns, um, about a half a teaspoon. All right, and then a pinch of uh, mustard seed, and then we're going to blend it up. Now what we're doing is we're going to blend up all of these ingredients first 
Um, and then we're going to do another blend with the fresh herbs. And the reason we're doing that is because if you add the fresh herbs when you blend it up the first time, they get all liquefied with the, with the ingredients, and then you end up with this like green dressing, which is very delicious, tastes just the same, but it doesn't have that look that you're looking for. And, you know, sometimes looks matter, so. <laughs> All right, go. <laughs> Body mixes are amazing, but they can also <laughs> do that type of thing. If you don't have the plunger, they can. Oh, we have a plunger? We don't have a plunger, but if you're careful with this, like, off. Hey, yeah. Do you want to turn it off? So the thing is, is that you know you can use this recipe in a blender or a food processor or really anything like that. Like you don't have to have like a fancy five hundred dollar blender to do this. Um, we actually a majority of the recipes we made in this book we made in our apartment in Virginia, which is pretty much the size of a closet, and we were using the blender like on our coffee table. <laughs> so yeah, it's working. <laughs> So, okay, I think you guys can hear me over the blender, right? Yeah. All right, so I can talk. <laughs> so, one of the other things, too, that we noticed, because um, we test these recipes like a bazillion times before we even went on the blog, and we tested them again before they went to the book, um, is that the ranch dressing in particular, people have really strong feelings about like their ranch dressing. Like, it has to have a certain flavor and a type of taste to it. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things like, uh, if you're one of those people who's a connoisseur of ranch dressing, I really hope you like this. Because, like, there was, there was a lot of feedback that was given, and we really tried to fine tune it over the years. All right, now we're going. Uh, the joys of live entertainment. <laughs> so, yeah, it's one of those, uh, we tried to pick recipes that, like, wouldn't require, like, heating up things and all that sort of stuff. But there's always the delay with the cooking, right? <laughs> all right. So here, let's have the... Let's have the all right. So now, now we're going to be adding um, two teaspoons of fresh parsley, and we're going to be adding um, two teaspoons of fresh dill. Oh, actually, I think we're using... Yeah, we're using this dill. Oh, that's right. Um, now, a lot of people actually try to like skip fresh herbs because they have this idea that it'll like, save money. In a lot of ways, it does. But one of the things that we figured out is that if you can find a way to, to work fresh herbs into like the food, um, and it's true, you can actually add them to like almost anything. I mean, you can add like scallions and like dill and like parsley to like a pancake recipe, and it's amazing. You know, like it's. I recommend just trying it. Like. Adding fresh herbs to your diet not only is like healthier for you, it's a great way to add like some greens, but it's also a way to to kind of just like add a little extra to like your meal, you know? Yeah. So, oh, all right, we're almost done. So, I went over time. I actually was worried I wasn't gonna have enough to say. So, and we have a question. So, I will take the question while he's blending it. What do you have? Um, my experience is the best way to keep basil is um, not to put it in the refrigerator. Um, to keep it in some place where it's sort of uh, not not too warm, but also like not too cold. Because once basil like touches extreme heats in any cold or or uh, heat or cold or whatever, it'll start to brown at the edges. Um, but honestly, I think that one of the best ways to get basil is if you can get it with still having the root on it, and if you wrap the root in like wet paper towels and then like a, a plastic bag, um, it will last forever. It lasts, I mean, until you use it up, you know, it's, it's good. So if you can find the basil with the root still attached, I'd recommend that. Was there any other questions? Oh yeah? You 
know, there was, there was a couple of them that were kind of, I wouldn't say they were challenging, it was more kind of like, even if we got it right, it just didn't taste good, you know? Um, there was like a couple of tuna fish recipes that were in the book that like, even when we got, you know, it was like it had the fishy flavor, it had like the right texture and everything to it. Um, it just, the final product wasn't great, you know? Um, for example, like there's, we actually did not vegan this recipe, but it was one that was like a lime jello recipe. They actually had, um, it was lime jello, tuna fish, and sour cream. And we were like, we can veganize that. <laughs> but, oh no, I'm sorry. I should repeat the questions. Um, well, her first question was the best way to, to store basil. Um, and her question was, was there a recipe that, um, I couldn't really find a way to veganize, like it was like a challenge in some way. Um, to be honest with you, I did not veganize the lime jello, tuna fish, sour cream, whole. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those things where I just, I mean, you know, we could have done it, we just bought like a ton of agar agar and just dive right in. But um, I don't know, I just didn't really feel like the world needed it, you know? I just didn't feel like it was gonna make the world a better place, so we didn't do that. <laughs> uh, is there any other questions? And she asked why um, uh, we like we prefer the brags to like tamari or soy sauce. And like I said, it has the has the B vitamins in it. You know, it's a liquid amino acids that like as a vegan we actually need to supplement in our diet. But it also has less sodium in it, like I said. Um, one of the things that I actually really love about it too is that it's one of those things where it's so versatile and a great way to get like a beefy flavor without having to like resort to, you know, uh, I don't know, like faux beef stock or vegetable stock. It's like, the other thing is a lot of broths out there are just salt, you know? So we also use a product in the book a lot called Better Than Bullion, which is a, a sort of a bullion base, which actually has, um, it's actually vegetable based. It's not salt based. So it's a lot better for you. Um, so, did you have a question? I was wondering, what did you do for the Friday? Oh, what did we do for the what? Oh, for the Friday. Oh, well, for the Friday, we actually have a picture of it. Um, we took a piece of tofu and we filled it with this sort of nutritional yeast sauce using this thing called a flavor injector. Now, if you guys have never had flavor injector, don't know what it is. It looks like this giant syringe. It's something like Paula Deen uses to like inject marinades and turkeys. Like it's it's for people who like they really are super into like barbecue and meat and they just want to like inject stuff in it. It's a crazy instrument. But we took ours, we reappropriated it, and instead we injected this cheesy sauce into a piece of tofu, and then you fry it on both sides. And it kind of takes the shape and the look of a, a, a fried egg. I mean, it's, it's square, but you know, it has like that same little lump on it and everything. But it, it, you hit it, and it has a liquid center. So yeah, we used it for a lot of stuff. It was kind of cool. You know, we actually did not have to use, oh sorry, she asked if we had to do, um, we had to ask permission for Betty Crocker to use the name Betty Goes Vegan. Um, we actually did not. Uh, Betty Crocker has actually been incredibly supportive of our project. Um, they, ever since we first started doing this, uh, they've been like tweeting our recipes and like reposting them. In their message boards, they actually tell people to go to our website for like vegan recipes. Um, they've been kind of awesome. You know, I'm not someone who's actually, like I said, I'm brand loyal, but I'm not usually brand loyal to people, like, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought I'd be loyal to, like, Betty Crocker, you know? <laughs> but they actually have been really awesome about it. And now they actually, every year in their Christmas cookie parade that they do, they now include a vegan cookie, you know? And they actually have vegan re recipes on their websites now, rather than, like, just having, like, vegetarian. So, you know, not a perfect company in some ways, but they actually were really embracing and supportive, and. Yeah, like they even like when our book came out, they even like uh, posted it on Facebook. So, yeah, it's been great. Yes. So she asked about. Basically, questions. She asked what our roles were in making the book. Um, do you want to... I buy the groceries and wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I do this. Yeah. He, he also helps to 
conceptualize a lot of stuff. Like when we had to do the, this thing called a beer can tofurkey, which I'm sure many of you guys live in the south of the the beer can chickens, where they take a whole can of beer and they like put it inside a chicken and they barbecue it. Well, we did that with the tofurkey. And um, that was like some sort of like architectural feat <laughs> to come up with this. Um, and Dan was there the whole time helping with the blueprints and all that, you know, <laughs> so he, he's very humble. Um, I, you know, I did a lot of the cooking, I'll admit, and um, I did a lot of the writing. Like, the book itself is basically in my voice, and, because um, I do most of the writing on the blog. So, that's kind of how it's getting done. Is there any other questions? Great, yeah, because you guys are so smart. I didn't even know what you guys were <laughs> Well, I hope, we have a lot of samples. So, and you guys should definitely get rewarded for staying to the end. <laughs> so, please come up for seconds. Oh, one more question. <laughs> oh, so she said, what is our favorite recipe to like help someone who's transitioning from being a meat eater? Um, we have a chicken pot pie recipe that's in here. That, yeah, I think that's a good one because it's a great way to like include the mock meat and like it has that, that sort of like traditional, you know, it's not a weird food or anything. Um, but it, it really is a good way to incorporate the mock meat and get people to try it while also, you know, like in, in a way that they don't feel like threatened by, you know. It's funny to think people be threatened by something that's vegetarian or vegan. It happens. I don't know. Who can explain this? Oh, so thank, thank you. you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah.